If I were to ask you to name the person who stands out most as an example of friendship in the Bible, the first answer, and probably the best answer, might be Jesus. But if I were to maybe narrow that down to the Old Testament, I can't help but think that most of us would answer Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of the first man chosen to be king of Israel, King Saul. King Saul initially showed great promise, but eventually showed himself to be more governed by fear than faith in his responsibilities given to him by God. His son, however, we're not told exactly why or what influences might have led them to this path, led him to this path, but Jonathan did not father, follow in his father's footsteps. Even before the incidents where Jonathan meets David and begins to interact with David, Jonathan shows himself to be a more honorable man than his father. But of course, what we really think of when we think of Jonathan is Jonathan and David. David, of course, as we even alluded to last week, he goes to the front lines to take his father, or rather his father's first three children, uh, some food and, and provisions as they're going uh, about their business, preparing to fight the Philistines. David, in the course of all this, he uh, goes out before all of Israel because none of them are courageous enough to step up and challenges Goliath and ultimately wins. But what happens after that is more of what we want to focus on this morning. We're told that after uh, David comes back, the victory is won over the Philistines, David has a, an interview with Saul, we're told that Jonathan, Jonathan formed a bond with David. Jonathan, we're told, loved David as his own soul. And as David was invited into the court of the king, to be his servant and eventually to be his best general, Jonathan and David became inseparable. Eventually, of course, the inseparable would be separated. David would have to go on the run because Saul sought his life. Jonathan did everything he could to prevent that, but the whole time he recognized David was in the wrong, or in the right, and his father in the wrong. Eventually, they would part ways for the last time, and before they could meet again, Jonathan would meet his end on another battlefield at the edge of a Philistine weapon. But what I want us to focus on for a few minutes this morning, as we've been looking at different characters in the life of David and trying to learn something from them, and something from uh, the relationship and how David responds to them, I want us to focus on this friendship, this bond that was created between David and Jonathan, as we consider, I hope, in a very personal way in our lives, who our Jonathans are. First, I want to throw something out there as we begin. This is something that I think is very clear in this passage, it's something I think is very foreign in our culture. <clears throat> And that is that affectionate friendship is wholesome. Whenever you see children, meaning young children, you see them with their friends. Oh, yes, they get into scraps sometimes. They get mad at each other because one took something, the other wanted, all sorts of things. But there is an openness, a sincerity, an affection that exists that isn't colored, at least in the early stages of life, by self-consciousness, by, oh, I, I need to look cool, I can't be, you know, actually expressing that I care about this person. No, it's, it's very genuine as a general rule. And yet at a certain point, for whatever reason, we tend to abandon that. We tend to view affection in a friendship scenario as something to be avoided, as something that's inappropriate. Now, don't get me wrong, there can be inappropriate forms of affection in a friendship. I, I understand that. But it's as if we're afraid to allow that component of a relationship to be part of who we are. 
I want us to notice specifically how the relationship between Jonathan and David is described. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. There is no self-consciousness about having that kind of care and affection for another person in this passage. There is no reticence to admit what kind of relationship existed. And yet far too often, especially between Christians, we just don't want to go there. I want us to think about the example that we have, even with Jesus. As Jesus is speaking with Peter, they both recall an event that happened before the resurrection, before the death, even. Peter is there talking with Jesus, and he turns, and he sees a disciple whom Jesus loved. What a name. What a description to be given. The disciple whom Jesus loved but specifically the one who had leaned back against him during the supper. Now, their culture was different, right? We don't recline in the way that they do. It would be strange for us to be sitting around the dinner table with our heads leaned up against each other. That's just not how we do things. But do we understand the implications here? There was a, an acceptance of the fact that those you love can be close. That those you love can be connected. That your love can be confessed. Some of this, I think, can be a, a difference in culture, as we've already said. Some of this, I think, can be a difference between men and women and their relationships with each other. Women are generally a, a little more affectionate in their uh, relationships with their female friends than men are with their guy friends. And, and some of that is natural, and we understand all that. I'm not suggesting that, you know, a couple of guys, like, hop in bed together and paint their nails or whatever. And I don't mean hop in bed in a weird way, but sit in the bed. No, yeah, you didn't talk about, well, you know, whatever. That's just, just strange. That's, that's effeminate, in fact. But... I fear, in some ways, uh, when we do see abuses of affection in our society, we, we tend to run the other way. Remember in Acts chapter 20, when Paul is about to leave Ephesus, he's gathered there with the elders of the Ephesian church, and it seems several of the members as well. And they're going to part. They're not going to see each other again, probably. Well, in fact, certainly, we know, looking back in hindsight. They're not going to see each other again, ever. At least not until the next life. And the scene there is very touching. There was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul. They kissed him, being sorrowful most of all, because of the word he had spoken. They would not see his face again. There's something to be said, especially among Christians. Christians who are called to be kindly affectionate to one another. Christians who are called to be closer than blood family because of the spiritual bond that we have. There's something to be said for Christians being intentional about expressing affection in an appropriate way because of the bond of friendship and fellowship that we share. In fact, I would argue, if someone does not, at least one person, does not express that kind of affection, it can become very unhealthy very quickly to live a life without expressions of, that person cares about me and is not afraid to express it and admit it. I don't know that David would have made it through one of the most trying times of his life 
without the open and caring support of his friend Jonathan. There is a, uh, a series that was done a long time ago. I believe the gentleman's name was Willard Tate. Uh, did a series of lessons on love. Some of y'all might be familiar. I don't know much about him, but I have listened to the lessons. And something that always stood out to me in the lessons that he presented was the idea that probably because of our culture, we've twisted things around to where we don't feel comfortable actually offering genuine compliments. Actually just saying, I really respect you. I really care about you. I really love you. I really appreciate this or that about you. We don't feel comfortable doing that, almost as if we're afraid, oh, well, that'll give them the big head. Oh, well, that'll, uh, that, that, that's too much. They, they already know. That's not the example we see. Our culture often distorts affection. People have even tried to distort the relationship between Jonathan and David. But we don't get to respond to that by neglecting affection. We don't get to respond to that by closing ourselves off from those who we are meant to be closest to. But secondly, as we consider Jonathan and David. A true friend puts the other first. Notice what happens in the life of Jonathan and David as they are on the verge of never seeing one another again. Jonathan, the rightful heir as far as human lineage is concerned to the throne of Israel as the son of the king, And now, on the verge of a choice that he has to make, whether to support his father in trying to kill David or trying to support David against his father. Very clearly, very openly, renounces whole claim to power before his friend. Instead, this is what he asks of his friend. He says, if I am still alive, Show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever, when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Jonathan saying, I know you're going to be the king, and not me. And that's okay. Now there's one kind of friendship that we're probably all familiar with. The kind of friendship that is based mainly on mutual interests. The kind of friendship that enjoys spending time with another because of uh, things that you can do together that you both enjoy and so forth. And then there's the kind of friendship that is willing to sacrifice for the other. There's the kind of friendship that in fact is willing even to suffer so the other can prosper. Jonathan and David were not friends simply because they enjoyed, I don't know, archery together or something like that, trying to hit coins with their slings. No, they were friends on a much deeper level, on a much more sacrificial level than that. Remember Jesus' words in John 15. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And of course, he follows that by saying, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Now we've talked about before, it's easy to look at that verse and say, oh yeah, I would take a bullet for someone. All right. In the context of marriage, for example, you take a bullet for your wife, but would you take out the trash for your wife? In the context of friendship, you take a bullet for your friend, would you tell your friend how much you care about them, especially when they need to hear it most? 
are you too uncomfortable? Would you let them express to you what's going on in their lives when you'd really rather be anywhere else than listening to it because it's just awkward and this is too, too deep, too personal. Greater love has no one in this than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus said as he prepared to lay down his life for his friends. Think about Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 6. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. He's describing the level of sacrifice he was willing to go to for people he considered friends, but who in many ways he had not even gotten a chance to be with much, to spend much time with. Certainly Timothy he had, but he had poured himself out as a drink offering, as a sacrifice for countless individuals, all to try and help them learn the message of the gospel. Really, all of this comes back down to Paul's exhortation in Philippians 2. It's something we have heard many times, I'm sure, but there's a big difference between hearing it and putting it into practice. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. We do realize this is completely and totally opposed to what our culture teaches us to do. I hope. Our culture teaches us that while, yes, being good, being generous to people, that's, that's good as far as it goes, my job ultimately is to make sure that I stand up for my rights. My job ultimately is to make sure that I stand up for what I'm owed. Jesus says no. Doesn't matter what your own, doesn't matter what your rights are, your job is to humbly count others more significant than yourselves. Your job is to put others in every possible way before yourselves. That's what a friend does, that's what a neighbor does. In ladies' class this week, we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And one of the things that stands out in that parable is that from the Samaritan's perspective, what made that injured Jew a neighbor was the fact that he needed help. And that's what the Samaritan did. He put that man, a man who hated him, a man who wouldn't have done the same for him most likely, he put that man before himself. As a true friend, I should want the other person to be more successful. I should want the other person to have things I don't have, to be blessed in ways that I'm not blessed. I should want the other person to surpass me. Many parents have told their children, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be better than me. And that is a, a natural desire within parents. But it should be a natural desire within all of us in every relationship. Not that we don't want to do our best, not that we don't want to grow as much as possible. But once I know I'm right before God, my priority should be the other person. Thirdly, we all need that friend. That friend who is willing to sacrifice. That friend who is not afraid to tell, them, to tell us that they care about us. We all need a friend like Jonathan, whether we admit it or not. This is David's lament. After Jonathan meets his end on the battlefield with the Philistines, David says, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant you have been to me. Your love was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now, two things we want to note here. Number one, people have tried to uh, 
uh, interpret this in some kind of twisted way in terms of the relationship between David and Jonathan. That's not what's being said here. And number two, we also see a little bit of David's flaws because he didn't exactly have the best track record in his relationships with women. But the point here is actually very valid. For those of us who are married, have been married, there is a bond, a, a relationship, a friendship even, that is created with that other person, unlike any other. And that's the way it should be. That doesn't mean you don't need other friends. I think about my best friend. I don't hide things from Liz. But there are times when I can have conversations, when I can be lifted up and encouraged by my best friend in a different way than my wife. And that also relieves her of some of that burden. My wife's best friend, the same way. She's able to talk with her in a way that, not that she's hiding anything from me, but it goes back to Solomon's statement about iron sharpening iron. We may have wonderful family, wonderful parents that we can talk to and get advice from, a wonderful spouse that is literally our soulmate through life. But we need friends too. We need those people like Jonathan who can provide something that no one else can. <laughs> Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. <clears throat> Again, this could apply to a marriage-type relationship, I think very rightly so. But it should also apply beyond that. In fact, he goes on to say a threefold cord is not quickly broken. We're not in any way excluding this to a romantic-type scenario. Solomon, in his wisdom, is telling us we need people. We need friends. Because if you try and go it alone, you're not going to get very far. Paul would say to the Thessalonian church in chapter 5 and verse 11 of the first letter, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing using that building analogy. If we're supposed to be growing as Christians, and it's very clear in Scripture that we are, don't we need to be built up by others? How are we going to grow otherwise? Oh yeah, I can build on my own foundation, but I need someone there helping me. That's why the Hebrews writer would say, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Well, I can stir myself up enough. No, you can't. I'm sorry, but no, you can't. We're not that skilled as human beings. As much as we, again, culturally, glorify the idea of self-sufficiency and independence, we're just not that good. We don't have that level of ability. If we're going to accomplish something, we need people helping us in that effort. And others need us helping in that effort. We can't do life alone. We need friends like this. We need the Jonathans in this world. I think about Barnabas in the New Testament, called the son of encouragement. One who is by Paul's side throughout a large portion of his ministry. The one who convince the rest of the church to believe this guy actually is legit. He actually has changed. We need those people. Even from the beginning, God said it is not good for man to be alone. And he wasn't just saying man needed a wife. Man needed another person. People need people. We were created that way. I would leave you with this thought. You might be thinking right now of your best friend or of a circle of best friends. 
that help you, that strengthen you, that comfort you. Or you might be thinking, I, I don't really have that. That all sounds really great, but I don't really have anyone in mind that fits that description. Sometimes it's hard to find a Jonathan. Someone who will be a friend, someone who will be like a brother. But the church is a great place to start looking. This is an environment that is designed to provide us with community, with support, with encouragement. And that is a privilege that far too often we take for granted. So this morning, if there's anything we can aid you in, whether you're struggling and need the prayers of the church and some struggle you're facing, whether you are struggling with something spiritual and a need to study and understand more about God's will, whatever the case might be, we want to be Jonathan's and Jonathanas. I don't know what the female version would be. We want to be that in your life. We want to be that for each other. So if there is some way we can help you, please let us know to be stand and sing. They tried my Lord and Master.